Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us today in celebration of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and its heritage. My name is Aslahan Bulut, and I have the privilege and honor to serve as the Law Librarian of Congress. Each year, the Law Library of Congress celebrates Human Rights Day with a panel discussion focusing on the understanding and recognition of a critical social, economic, or cultural human rights issue. In previous years, we hosted a number of events that highlighted various aspects of this topic. Some of them were contact tracing and the right of privacy, impact of the women's suffrage movement today, repatriating Native American cultural property and remains, human rights in Eastern Europe, Islamic law reform, rights of refugees and internally displaced persons and many more. This year, we have chosen to focus on the intersection of health and human rights with a panel of leading health and legal scholars and practitioners who will discuss the interactions between health and human rights and how human rights can help to strengthen public health systems across the globe and improve the response to health challenges. With coronavirus pandemic changing our lives in a way that no one could have predicted and imagined, we wanted to emphasize how crucial it is to put our minds together and work together to ensure that human rights are central to recovery efforts across the world for every human being that walks the earth. And now it's my pleasure to yield this virtual floor to our panel moderator, Assistant Law Librarian of Congress for Legal Research, Peter Rudick. Take it away, Peter. Thank you, Asliha. I'm honored to start the conversation with our distinguished speakers and ask them to share their opinions about relations between human rights and the right to healthcare. Probably nobody in our audience will argue if I say that health is very important to everyone. It is a certain central element of human lives that debates whether health is a right or not, whether people are entitled to protecting this most treasured asset still continue. Right to health is not a simple political declaration. A substantial corpus of international documents provides for the protection of health. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, adoption of which we commemorate today, stated in Article 25 that everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for health and well-being of himself and his family, including medical care. The right to enjoy highest attainable standard of physical and mental health was confirmed by the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. 20 years ago, the, this right was recognized by appointing the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health. According to an article published not long ago in the Harvard Human Rights Journal, Every country except of South Sudan is a party to at least one human rights treaty that addresses the right to health or other health-related rights. UCLA re research found that more than half of the world's countries have some degree of guaranteed specific right to public health, and medical care for their citizens is included in their national constitutions. However, there are 86 countries whose constitutions don't guarantee their citizens any kind of health protection. Today, I would like to ask our panelists to express their opinions about the recognition of the right to health care, assess challenges to the right caused by recent technological developments, and of course, by the ongoing global health crisis. Let me introduce our speakers. Alicia Eli Yemen is currently a lecturer on law and the senior fellow on global health and rights at the Petri Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. She is adjunct senior lecturer on health policy and management at the Harvard School of Public Health and senior advisor on human rights and health policy at the Global Health Justice Organization Partners in Health. Her career has bridged academia and activism. She has served on numerous UN, WHO, and other global expert committees including being appointed by the UN Secretary General as an international expert to the Independent Accountability Panel for Women's Children and Adolescents Health and Sustainable Development Goals. She was the Chief Consultant to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and serves currently on the WHO's Technical Advisory Group on Health Technology Assessments. 
Yemen holds Juris Doctor and Master of Public Health degrees from Harvard University and a doctorate in law from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. She has over 150 publications on international and comparative law, international development, and global health. Helena Nigrin Krug is a senior advisor on human rights and the law in the executive office of UNAIDS in Geneva. And her role there is to help in defining the organizational position on policy matters. Prior to joining UNAIDS, she led the work on health and human rights at the World Health Organization. Before joining WHO, Helena worked at the UN Center for Human Rights and at the UN Human Rights Monitor in Haiti and Tanzania as a relief worker with the Red Cross in Rwanda. Helena has master's degrees in international law from Harvard Law School and from the London School of Economics, as well as a bachelor's degree in law. She has authored numerous articles and publications on health and human rights. Judith Shander is a professor at the Faculty of Political Science, Legal Studies, and Gender Studies at the Central European University in Vienna. She is admitted to practice law in Hungary and worked at Siemens and Siemens in London. Professor Shander is recognized as the authority in the field of biomedical law and bioethics. She published 11 books in the field of human rights and biomedical law, and her works appeared in English, French, Portuguese, and Hungarian languages. She worked in major European and American universities, including Stanford, NYU, McGill. She also served as the chief of the bioethics section at the UNESCO, and since September 2005, she is a founding director at the Center for Ethics and Law in Biomedicine at the Central European University. She has completed 10 European research projects funded by the European Commission in the field of biobanks, genetic data, stem cell research, organ transplantation, and human reproduction. In October 2019, she received a Synergy Grant from the European Research Council, which is the highest recognition in the field of research in the European Union. And Lucy Mice is the health team lead in the Asia Bureau of USAID. In her current position, she manages a team of technical experts who work to support the COVID-19 task force at USAID. From the regional perspective, as well as continuing their usual work in urban health, maternal child health, infectious diseases, and digital advancements in health. Ms. Mice has had a 30-year career in public health and has done everything from finding landing lights for dirt air strips, so she could implement an expanded immunization project in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, to providing emergency clinical services during the ASEC tsunami. Ms. Mice holds a degree in English, a nursing degree, and a master's degree in public health. She is currently pursuing a doctoral degree in global public health leadership at Indiana University. And my first question would be for Dr. Yemen. Could you please tell us what is the right to health? How universal is it? How to achieve health-related objectives named by international human rights documents? Well, first of all, thank you so much to you, Peter, and to Aslihan for the invitation to participate in this panel. Um, and it's really a great honor and pleasure to join my esteemed panelists today and to celebrate Human Rights Day in this way. Uh, so I'm going to answer that question actually in three ways. And first, I should start by introduction by underscoring some of what you've already said, Peter, which is that um, health and human rights are related. It's not just the right to health, but health is indivisible and interdependent on a number of civil and political rights. It's hard to enjoy the right to health if you don't have access to information, if you don't have freedom of movement, for example, uh, if you don't have political rights even. Uh, and similarly, health is also, as we've seen clearly in COVID, a, a product of having those um, civil and political rights as well. So I, I, I'm going to make my remarks about the right to health, but I do want to set that out. So there are really three ways I want to answer that broad, very important question. 
The first and most obvious is to start with international law, which you have already mentioned. The core formulation of the right to health is in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Um, and that uh, sets out a right to health, not just to medical care. It includes health care, but it also includes uh, preconditions to health, public health conditions, water and sanitation, environmental hygiene conditions, issues like vaccinations, which are very much in the news. And importantly, it includes both freedoms, so freedoms from coercive treatment, as well as entitlements to material entitlements to care and those preconditions. And in the latter case, there are a variety of different obligations entailed, but uh, some of them are subject to progressive realization in accordance with available resources, which we may speak about later. So as you also mentioned, Peter, there are an array of international treaties that contain elements of the right to health and virtually every country in the world except for South Sudan has ratified at least one of those, including the United States. The United States has ratified the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which contains provisions about racial discrimination in the context of healthcare. Um, so so the, it is a widely um, recognized right. And when I say ratified, for those people who are not international lawyers, that means not just signed the treaty, but taken the steps to commit to domesticate that through internal legislation and policy. So that's the, the first level at which I would answer the question. The second is, what do constitutions say? You also noted that the right to health is enshrined in a lot of constitutions. Um, and, and different countries have taken very a, a variety of different approaches to the right to health. Some constitutions like Kenya's iconic 2010, very transformative aspirational constitution, uh, virtually took verbatim the definition in international uh, human rights law. Other uh, constitutions uh, can take very broad approaches like the constitution, the 1988 constitution in Brazil, but they're quite different from international law. Other constitutions like the Indian constitution, which has also been quite transformative, so that's not the, the difference, uh, really doesn't have a right to health per se, but has recognized what we understand is elements of the right to health and the right to medical care in a variety of contexts through the right to life in their constitution. And then there are some countries um, that don't have the right to health in their constitutions, but certainly have it recognized in statutes. And the most obvious one that comes to mind is the National Health Service in the UK and in Britain and Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, of course. Uh, and, and finally, I should say, and this goes to the complexity of doing research on this issue, a, a number of countries don't per se have a right to health in their constitutions, but have what's called a constitutional blocks, uh, which is a device originally uh, used by the Conseil d'Etat in France. And through those constitutional blocks, they have incorporated international human rights instruments into their constitutions at the level of their constitutions. And that is reasonably uh, common in, in a number of countries in Western Europe. It's also quite common throughout um, much of South America in the post-dictatorship uh, new social constitutions that we see across much of South America. Um, the third level at which I would talk about what is the right to health um, is, is the role of judiciaries in countries in constructing what the right to means in specific contexts over time in an evolutionary way. And I would point there to uh, two particular elements of this. One I've already alluded to with India, which is that judiciaries have adopted 
non-formalistic, anti-formalistic readings of their constitutions, which has been extremely important in developing the right to health and international and constitutional and domestic law. So for example, in Colombia, which has a very, very rich jurisprudence on the right to health, in the quite iconic constitution of 1991, there was, health was set out as a public service, not a fundamental right. But over time, the constitutional court uh, adopted opinions that then converted that into a fundamental right. They argued that it was a contrived uh, dichotomy to consider health uh, only through uh, convoluted attachments to the right to life. And so it became a fundamental right in the, the Colombian constitution. And it then actually was uh, recognized in the statutory, the framework statutory law on health that was adopted by the Congress in 2015 in Colombia. In other countries similarly, and I wanna emphasize that this is not just in rich or upper middle income countries. In Uganda, for example, uh, the right to health was a directive principle in their constitution, is a directive principle in their constitution, but over time, the constitutional court has recognized at least uh, uh, aspects of maternal health care, essential obstetric care as fundamental rights in their constitution. So that is the, the changing of the rules under which rights are considered. But a second way in which courts are involved in deciding what the right to health means is that, that it's a very unstable norm. It's very unstable because epidemiological shifts continue to happen as we've seen in COVID and, and that changes what would be reasonably expected of governments to do for their citizens. But it's also unstable because we don't have stable normative agreements about what the right to health means. And we can see that in the United States now uh, over divorce, div um, debates about abortion, for example. Uh, so that has been the case across the world. And uh, for example, the Mexican Supreme Court recently argued that the criminalization of abortion uh, on any grounds was unconstitutional. And, and argued very centrally that it was unconstitutional because it violated women's rights to health. So that is another way in which the right to health takes on meaning. It's, it also makes it, because of these different intersecting uh, interpretive um, uh, frameworks, it's, it's, it's complex to do research and comparative legal research in this area. And I'll stop there and I'm eager to hear um, the conversation about implementation and practice as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. You said about the importance of human rights for quality health conditions and healthcare. Now I would like to ask Helena Nigren Krug how to implement national health policies consistently with human rights. Well, thank you first, uh, Peter, for inviting me. It's a great honor and pleasure. I'm uh, speaking to you from France, uh, just close to Geneva, where I work for UNAIDS, a UN agency focused on HIV and AIDS. And I also want to thank Robert and Aslahan and the whole team. So let me just start by saying um, that Yes, we've just gone from World AIDS Day to Human Rights Day, and I think the HIV response is one of the areas where we've learned a lot about the intersection between health and human rights. And I just heard today at our board how HIV-related stigma and discrimination remains high across the world. There was a presentation of a survey um, that reported that 50% of people age 15 to 49, held discriminatory attitudes towards people living with HIV. So this is just an example of how difficult it is to put in place health services when you still have so much human rights violations in society, such as stigma and discrimination, because people will not want to come and get tested for HIV 
uh, when they fear stigma and discrimination in society. So in terms of implementing human rights and health and implementing the right to health, there are all these things that happen out there in society that actually determine whether somebody's even going to come to the healthcare services in the first place. So like Ali said, Alicia Yamin said, we have to look at health and human rights very broadly when we're looking at creating an enabling environment, uh, an, an environment where people feel that they can access health services. And of course, it's very lucky those that can access health services. Um, as you know, that uh, health services are not always available about a hundred, and when they are available, they are often uh, unaffordable about 100 million people a year are pushed into extreme poverty because of out-of-pocket spending on health. And when we talk about the right to health, as Ali said, there's freedoms and there's entitlements. And uh, I wanted to mention a framework that we call often in international human rights law, Triple AQ, which was an articulation of what the right to health means by the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, in the year 2000, and they explained that governments that are committed to take these steps, as, as Ali explained, of progressive realization forward, need to do so in a way that conforms with this triple AQ. The first A is about availability. Make sure that you have health services, hospitals, community health services, nurses, doctors, good uh, medications, all of that has to be available. But it's not enough that it's available, it has to also be accessible. And they said this means economically accessible, i.e. affordable, coming back to my point about 100 million people around the world pushed into poverty because of out-of-pocket pocket spending on health, we have a lot of work to do on affordability. Also that there's information, that it's available on a non-discriminatory basis, and we have a lot of population groups that are suffering discrimination, um, persons with disabilities, ethnic, religious, racial, linguistic, uh, and other minorities, indigenous communities, uh, women, girls, adolescents, LGBTIQ populations. We have a lot of populations that uh, feel a lot of uh, stigma and discrimination in the health sector. And then the last uh, dimension of uh, accessibility is physical accessibility, that health services have to be physically accessible, i.e. also for rural populations, for persons with disabilities, et cetera. The second A in the AAAQ is about acceptability. Make sure that the health services are culturally appropriate, that they are gender sensitive, that they respond to people's life cycle requirements. And the last, the Q is about quality. So when you're asking about how to implement health services consistent with the right to health, that's, I think, a quite useful framework to say, you know, we're all looking at using our resources and pushing forward progressively, but what is the frame for doing that, that triple AQ? But for human rights process, this is also very important. And when we look at implementing health services and health systems consistent with human rights. We also talk about the process, so participation, ensuring that we have communities around the table. And it's not just about being human rights sensitive. We know, for example, from HIV that it also allows us to do better in terms of delivering services that make sense for the people that are going to use them. Um, we have tons of examples in, in HIV. Um, let me give you one that's, uh, yeah, HIV, the first AIDS cases sort of are 40 years now since we had the first AIDS cases. And even before then we had hepatitis. And in the Netherlands, it was actually people who were injecting drugs themselves that said, there's this new epidemic called HIV. Uh, there's, there's no treatment available. We need to get clean needles so we can at least try to curb the spread of HIV in our community of injecting drug users. It wasn't somebody sitting in a university. It wasn't somebody sitting in a, in a UN agency who came up with this. It was people who inject drugs themselves. And we see that all the time in HIV, that when we involve the community, we get much better uh, feedback of, in terms of what works uh, in terms of the public health policies that we're putting into place. 
So you're asking about implementing uh, in a human rights-based way. It's basically about taking those human rights principles, participation, non-discrimination, accountability, another important one Ali mentioned uh, uh, a little bit about, that we're talking about human health as a human right. So we're not talking about charity, we're not talking about commodities, we're talking about people having entitlements to access health care. And therefore, accountability is very important and redress and monitoring <clears throat> and involving the communities in that monitoring process. So I'll stop there, Peter. I look forward to the discussion. I hope it's given you a bit of a flavor of what we mean by implementing. And there are lots of tools out there. Many of your panelists here have been involved in creating some of these tools for governments that want to be uh, making sure that their national health policies are consistent with human rights. Um, there are lots of ways to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. You are right, there are many tools, but there are even more challenges. And to continue to talk about the challenges, my question for Professor Shander would be about protecting human rights in the course of advancing medical and biological innovations. Mm -hmm. New biotechnologies, such as genome editing, stem cell therapy, raised many important human rights concerns. How can human rights respond to these emerging technologies? Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'm also very happy to be here, and I think it's a very nice circle to discuss uh, human rights in, uh, in various contexts, and of course the COVID pandemic uh, provides a very special framing of the discussion uh, today. I think that um, uh, when we're speaking about new emerging technologies, especially biotechnologies, it's not completely evident what are the connections to human rights. Many times I've been involved in uh, such a discussion. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we can, if we interpret uh, uh, human rights as, uh, as a kind of uh, global legal franca of understanding common values, it helps us to contextualize uh, new challenges. What I've seen many times in case of stem cell research, reprogenetics, biobanking, genetic testing, screening, in pre-implantation genetics testing, and now recently genome editing, that uh, uh, many times people who are stakeholders, they would like to jump to the regulation. And these regulations are of course isolated and often not coherent. When we put them into the context of human rights, then it offers us of a kind of a need to compare, for instance, competing technologies. And I also to think about accessibility of non-discriminatory access to these technologies. Uh, Interestingly, it's very rarely happening. So human rights lawyers, those who work also for the, uh, in the field of right to health, they always have to uh, struggle and they have to argue that it's an important dimension. The first uh, gesture, whatever, is actually it's also about digital technologies, not exclusively in the field of biotechnologies. The first reaction is always, okay, let's make what is the licensing, accreditation, what is used, and of course it goes with the regulation. And in a later stage, it comes the question, but it involves uh, free speech, freedom of research. It's a new type of healthcare accessibility. And now we are capable of transforming ourselves. So these technologies are no longer uh, so distant from humans, but it's uh, very much at the core of influencing us uh, human beings. And uh, of course, human rights is often um, accused uh, by uh, using old Roman law principles as if nothing has uh, changed in this field. But actually, if you're looking at the recent uh, innovations in the field of law, not only by a recent instrument by UNESCO on artificial intelligence and cultural heritage ethical principles, the Oviedo Convention, the uh, additional protocols to that, but several other instruments, we could find that there are numerous rights which are interpreting the right to health in a very specific context. Think about of very evidently of a right to refuse medical treatment, even life-saving medical treatment, how much it developed in many countries. 
uh, even during COVID, I was a little bit surprised how many countries changed their uh, legislation. And even they're using uh, Switzerland soon, they will use not a medically assisted suicide uh, law, but even technically assisted suicide. Uh, right not to know that is also of a new right in the field of uh, genetics, uh, mainly genetic testing screening, also of a, a different forms of consent in case of uh, biobanking, um, connecting human dignity with uh, some contested technologies such as uh, human cloning. Uh, right to genetic consultation in case of uh, predictive testing. It's a part of the Oviedo Convention, for instance. Uh, several courts, uh, in the first in Singapore, recognized the right to genetic identity. And uh, interesting, this new right has been interpreted in case of uh, in a field of assisted reproduction. When um, uh, unfortunately, I was also surprised when I made the study how many case, how many times gametes and embryos are mixed up and uh, sometimes even both parents uh, from gametes or just from one it's very difficult to provide any remedy but the, basically the couple who went through a very complicated treatment find of a mixed uh, genetic identity and how uh, to interpret what are the losses they have a child right so that's if they want it, but what about genetic identity? The same thing from children's rights is also in, in numerous treatments, new forms of treatments. For instance, in case of uh, uh, anonymous uh, gamete donations, uh, they also claim if the children who are adopted have a right to know their parents, maybe those who are involved in such technologies, they also have a right to know. And um, also over, we're speaking not any longer just about healthcare, but about enhancement. What are the uh, borders between enhancement? Do I have a right to uh, get certain treatments, which are not just repairing certain functions, but helping for me to uh, perform better? And it's very much related to aging, when it's, of course, we could say, why not? The, that people who are physically fit, they also would like to be uh, mentally fit. And if that means certain type of irregular treatments, maybe that should be a part of uh, uh, their, their treatment. And the mental self-determination, it's also coming as a new rights, also new forms of bodily integrity. Uh, do we speaking about the uh, same human rights when we speaking about uh, humans in a molecular level? I also was very much interested. I wrote some studies about of uh, human rights on a molecular level. It's it's not uh, evident sometimes, uh, and I think over the conventions, some UNESCO declarations, especially in the 1991 of the human genome and human rights, almost automatically transformed the human rights norm in when we're speaking about genes and uh, gametes and it's I, I think it's not the same but of course because it carries an important information we should discuss uh, that as well robotic and uh, human rights to help you know in many medical care is now uh, uh, given in the assistance of robotics for some people it provides a help uh, for the elderly but some people it's dehumanizing process so we have a different understanding about whether the technology is actually enhancing human rights i think in many ways it can be interpreted as enhancing human rights but it's in the same time it's providing different challenges so what follows from uh, that uh, in in the field of uh, or domain i think the one is that uh, we have to look at these new tech challenges because now we are no longer speaking about the classical dichotomy between health and disease, but this is of a kind of more complicated process of optimization or be speaking about of what is, uh, for instance, uh, of a genetic condition or a, a alteration from uh, the majority. It's not so easy to speak about uh, genetic discrimination, although uh, several uh, international and national documents included uh, that as well, but it's not completely evident what we mean by that. So actually uh, we have to, uh, one way is to interpret human rights norms and to currently discuss them so that they will be applicable to these numerous challenges which we are uh, facing uh, right now. 
The other uh, way is that what I have seen uh, quite uh, interesting and impressive that numerous new rights have been uh, developed, uh, not only in the digital field like right to be forgotten, but also in the field of uh, biotechnology. And, uh, um, especially in the field of uh, genetics. And I think that it's also related to a phenomenon which we are increasingly uh, uh, facing with. Uh, Sheila Jesnov spoke about of textuality of uh, uh, life sciences. And we lawyers, we deal for several thousands of years with text, right? This is our... our work we are trying to interpret stretch and to find of uh, difficulties contradictions analogies and life sciences were mostly based on observations and with genetics actually they are started to write down of uh, not only actg but also with transforming the letters and the whole discourse started to be a little bit closer to a way of uh, how lawyers we see the world and uh, uh, genome editing is perhaps the, one of the technology which provides a lot of challenges uh, because uh, on one hand we can look at that uh, uh, we could give a chance of life and health for children and babies who otherwise wouldn't have this opportunity. On the other hand, uh, since the technology is not yet safe, we may create of a, even a heritable characteristics which are off target, uh, which were not intended consequences, not completely understanding of what are the kind of connections with uh, other genes, but it's potentially shaking the whole uh, discourse, which uh, was based on the one hand of the pro-life camp and the other hand, the pro-choice camp. Those who are in favor of pro-life and usually they are non-interventionists. Now they have to support the treatment, right? Because they would uh, give uh, chances of life or for some uh, children who would not have a chance to uh, uh, live because of, or with, with very poor health. But those who are in favor of autonomy and the right to choose between the treatments, they would face of, uh, numerous conceptual obstacles of uh, on behalf of whom they are making decision or uh, this comes to the, the uh, future generations issue. So then in my field there, there are enormous uh, um, uh, things are happening and fundamental questions are happening. And of course, if we think about even in a broader context that this whole shift from uh, the genetics, I think provided very much the shift from we health, the kind of uh, uh, more collective based on right to health issues to a kind of individual that when I assess my risk, and I argued uh, that the COVID pandemic is showing us how important is the community. I cannot autonomous, autonomously just defend my right, even if I'm very rich, I, I cannot uh, exempt myself from the pandemic. I have to tolerate and I have to imagine myself as a part of society. So again, the we health is getting uh, very important because only together we can uh, tackle this very, um, dangerous uh, pandemic. And then I, I think it's very much a different tendency and the different drive to the autonomy which dictated of access to uh, numerous uh, these technologies. And I, I think that we also have to aware when we're speaking as just the last word about these new technologies that the scientific methods are different than legal methods, even if they're getting a little bit closer with this new textuality of life sciences. But when we interpret of uh, the legal risks and, and the risk of the procedures, that is a two independent procedures, but I always think it's fascinating to work in this field, although it's, it's challenging every day. I do a lot of field work and I also suggest for human rights lawyers in order to understand what is at stake to communicate a lot with scientists and hopefully I, what I see you know, with Jennifer Dudna, for instance, is a new type of scientist, female scientist. I was very happy to see her in that role, are started to share their hesitation with the public and they help us to communicate with them better because then we understand better the human rights challenges of these new uh, 
emerging technologies. And I also think that these are transformative technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judith. You perfectly explained how these new developments are connected with human rights or otherwise human rights are connected with these developments. And you said that, and I will probably not make a mistake also following your presentation that the significance of these challenges probably increased now during this ongoing health crisis, during the pandemic. And that is why my next question to Ms. Mice will be, what can we learn from the response to the pandemic? What was and still is the impact of the COVID pandemic on human rights and health? Thank you for that question. I have indeed spent the last two years of my life focusing on COVID-19 and the pandemic, um, working for USAID, the US government, they have been working on global efforts, but my focus is Asia, so my comments will come from that Asian experience. And we have seen some very troubling trends in Asia, not only in the right to health, but also in some other fundamental rights. Anxiety and concern over the impact of the pandemic as the science evolved and epidemiologists learned more about the behavior of COVID-19 triggered, in my opinion, a cavalier attitude to human rights. In an effort to rid the world of the virus, governments at the local, state, national, and international levels have been more concerned about limiting the virus and less concerned about limiting human rights. I offer my observations um, based on the articles of the UN Universal Declaration on Human Rights that's how I organize my thoughts, but I am talking about just as there is health in all policies, there are health implications in many of the articles from this declaration. So I don't actually focus so much on the right to health, which my other panelists have well explored, but I looked at some of the implications. It seems as a public health expert that the biggest issue is the tension between individual rights and the collective good. COVID-19 has forced countries and societies to rebalance individual civil and political rights against the more collective public good rights, such as the right to health. Um, one area this plays out in is one of the most fundamental public health activities, which is surveillance and contact tracing. But contact tracing in 2021 is not the door knock and shoe leather that it used to be. It now is all the new technology. It is global positioning systems. It is cell phone apps. It's facial recognition. And in Asia, the way governments are using some of this new technology to do contact tracing is of concern. In China, the government color coded your one's risk and embedded that in a mobile tracking app that was then with, uh, contained in another very popular app. In South Korea, the location information of infected citizens is posted on government websites, blogs, social media accounts, supposedly after the citizen data is anonymized. And in Singapore, the authorities are now using data collected from contact tracing for criminal investigations. So the issue from both public health and human rights standpoints is personal privacy. How is personal information protected, given that much of the data analysis is done by third party companies. Um, uh, everybody has probably experienced getting one of those letters that say we regret to inform you there's been a data breach and your personal information has been shared. Um, so it's a real concern. One of the other concerns is the conditioning that citizens might endure if they get used to having mobile tracking apps because they want to avoid an infection what happens when the government starts using mobile tracking apps for other purposes and they end up collecting significant amounts of data because of these new electronic abilities. I am not a human rights expert. I am a public health policy person. However, I am currently enrolled in a doctoral program and we have sent, spent the semester discussing public health and human rights. So I would like to offer some observations on how health comes out in some of the other rights. And I'd like to start with Article 19, which is especially critical to consider. It states that everyone has the right 
to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Yet at the same time, Dr. Tedros has said over and over and over, we are dealing with a dual pandemic, not only of COVID-19, but also of this infodemic that is this deluge of not only disinformation, which is deliberately set out, but misinformation, which is just a muddle of false rumors and information. In Papua New Guinea, one of our countries, it has only a 3% vaccination rate. But recently, because of misinformation, tribal elders caused the government to pull back their uh, mobile vaccination efforts because the myth had been set out that a vaccination was the equivalent of the mark of the devil. Well, Papua New Guinea is a very religious country, and so this myth resonated and created havoc. Um, it, is, it is a serious in, issue, and it truly is two pandemics, and there are other facets to it. In some countries, governments have beaten and arrested journalists for telling the truth. The governments don't want a free exchange of information shared widely. Journalists who are disseminating accurate information have been jailed. Just last week in Uzbekistan, an activist who had reported on corruption that um, in the grants that the government from Uzbekistan had received to do COVID-19 programming from the Asian Development Bank, after he reported that, he was smeared and beaten and harassed. The other thing that has been part of freedom of expression is a lot of governments have been very leery of the true publication of the number of cases of COVID, hospitalizations, and death rates. There are still two countries in Asia, Turkmenistan and North Korea, where there has been no reported cases of COVID-19. And of course, we know that cannot be true. Uh, social media is another incredible giant that's been implicated in how we have freedom of expression during this pandemic. Four months ago, Facebook announced that they had removed 20 million pieces of false information since the beginning of the pandemic. Unfortunately, researchers have shown that false information is stickier than truthful information. So if you can imagine 20 million pieces floating out there. And it doesn't help that messaging has been evolving. While there's a real reason for that, that it matched the science, sometimes the common person trying to understand, do I wear a mask, do I not wear a mask, has not been able to keep up with all the different messages coming out. And it has been confusing. Another critical article is Article 23, with the components to the right to work, including phrases such as free choice of employment, just and favorable conditions of work, and protection against unemployment. Well, try telling the nurses and doctors who had to do mandatory overtime as colleagues died around them about that right, or try telling people who were told that they were now considered essential workers and they had to report, but they didn't have the protective gear that could protect themselves as they were working, or the millions of day laborers in Asia who were summarily dismissed, returned to their villages, had no social protection rights. COVID-19 pandemic has upended labor markets and has shown a bright light on inequality in the workplace. Article 16 is on the right to marry, and it mentions men and women of full age having the right to marry. And for years in my work, uh, early marriage has been a health issue because if you're too early married, you get pregnant and then there are outcomes that can be very difficult, still births, low birth weights. So preventing child uh, marriage has been a critical area for us to work in. And now, <clears throat> During the pandemic, many of our missions have noticed backsliding, that because of schools being shuttered, isolation from friends and support networks, millions of girls have suffered. 
uh, in Bangladesh alone, which unfortunately is one of the countries in Asia that on the bright side is trying to address this, but on the dark side has a real issue. The government believes that the number of child marriages has increased between 11 and um, has increased 13%, which means between 11,000 and 13,000 child brides have been forced into marriage during this pandemic. And if you think about it, the effects of that early marriage are going to long outlast the effects of the pandemic and that, that they will be affecting those women for the rest of their lives. Article uh, 26 is the right to education, which is also such a fundamental right and it too has been compromised. Many schools have nutrition feeding programs which address malnutrition and household food insecurity. So they're a critical part of overall health. And sometimes they provide the only calories children get. But many schools in Asia as around the world have been shuttered. In March, April, and May of 2020, it was almost 100% of schools that were closed. Then some schools started to reopen. But you have Bangladesh and the Philippines where schools were closed for over a year. And unfortunately, data and evidence are coming in now that school closures were not necessarily the best way to keep children safe and that the impact on their mental health, the isolation, the loss of learning has had a serious impact. I want to read you two statistics that are really very telling. Uh, they're from an October 2021 report from UNESCO, and I quote, in the East Asia and Pacific region, almost 1.2 million girls are at risk of not returning to school. UNESCO estimates that about 12 million children from pre-primary to university level will drop out of school in South and West Asia as a result of the pandemic with pre-primary affected most profoundly. So for our domestic audience, that is the equivalent of all children under the age of 18 dropping out of school in Oklahoma, South Dakota, Vermont, Virginia, Mississippi, Iowa, Hawaii, DC, Connecticut, Montana, Wisconsin, Wyoming, and Pennsylvania. As you can imagine, that would have a serious impact on our nation's fabric. So the summary is my answer to is that COVID-19 has not only significantly impacted the right to health, but it is a, a ripple effect spreading to other essential human rights. In Asia, the region I know best, it is young women and girls, as well as many other marginalized communities that have suffered the most. And the tragedy is that this is not our last pandemic, and we have not learned enough to avert another pandemic, and we must do better for the sake of all of humankind. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you to all our speakers for sharing your thoughts with us today. Would you like to comment or add something to Lucy's presentations? If not, then I, let me ask you a few more questions. And, uh, I would I have like a comment, ah, please. Yes, please give it. If I may, no, listening to Lucy, I, it just reminded me so much of the early days of HIV, where governments take very strict, stringent measures to combat a virus and don't always think about the repercussions they have on human life. Uh, we're still battling that. Uh, for example, travel restrictions. We still have 47 countries that have HIV travel restrictions. It was only this year that New Zealand removed their travel restrictions for HIV. So we, we, and we're still battling. There are many other examples, but this was a situation where and, and in human rights, governments can limit uh, certain human rights in the name of public health, in the name of public morals, in the name of a public emergency. We saw it under terror, terrorism threat, <clears throat> and we're seeing it now under COVID. But when they don't do it thoughtfully, when they don't do it in a way that is human rights sensitive, and we do have a framework for doing that, making sure it's proportional, making sure it's the least restrictive alternative, 
making sure that it's time limited, making sure that it's backed by a law, making sure that it's non-discriminatory, et cetera, et cetera. If governments take knee-jerk reactions to viruses, to terrorism, to any public security, we have these horrible consequences that Lucy is, is outlining. And, and in HIV, we are just seeing the beginning, like Lucy says, of what this means uh, for, for women and girls. In sub-Saharan Africa, six out of seven new HIV infections among adolescents are among girls. And when we can keep them in school, that's the best protection from HIV. And now, as Lucy was saying, all these girls and young, young people who are not going to school because of COVID, HIV infections are rising. We have for the first time this year, tuberculosis deaths rising that has not happened since a decade. So yes, it's very, very sad. And I really want to echo what Lucy just said, over. Elena, I think you started to answer the question which I wanted to ask you, because following Lucy's presentation, I wanted to link the right to health with people's access to healthcare. And in the background of your Zoom screen, I see the phrase end inequality, because right to health depends on the distribution of material resources, how to ensure their equitable allocation, what should be done by the states in this regard, what should be the state duties and how they can be determined. Thank you, Peter. So again, there are frameworks out there in uh, the right to health. And the right to health says, as Ali mentioned earlier, that it has to be progressively realized, but that has to be done also in a certain way. So if a government is just building tertiary healthcare services for the rich in the capitals, that's not consistent with the right to health. There is a minimum core. It says, when you start looking at the distribution of resources, start with this minimum core package. And there are things that Ali mentioned, like safe and potable water, adequate sanitation, nutritious food, basic immunizations, et cetera, et cetera. Essential medicines, for example. So not all the most expensive medicines to start with, but the essential medicines. And WHO says that every country should have a model list of essential medicines that should be available in every health facility. So it does give a framework in terms of prioritizing these very basics. And we know that things like safe and potable water are extremely important for health. Um, and, and we know that all these determinants, uh, underlying conditions, as Ali called them, are sometimes more important than actual health care, because we're out there in society every day. We, we're eating a food, hopefully healthy food. We're crossing the road, hopefully safely crossing the road. We're we're interacting with our peers, hopefully uh, protected from violence. Um, hopefully our mental health and well-being is flourishing because we're not being harassed or, or being mistreated uh, at school or in the workplace or, or being beaten at home. So there are all these societal factors out there that, that the government also has to address. And some of them are less costly as well and, and actually require leadership. Again, coming back to my example of HIV and stigma and discrimination, a lot that we do in HIV isn't a matter of a lot of money. I mean, even now with medicines, we got the prices down, but it's about leadership. If the government is speaking out against discrimination, uh, we can come a long way in getting people uh, tested and, and onto treatment and getting good health in the society. But we have many countries, we still have 70 countries that criminalize homosexuality. We have a handful that still have the death penalty for, for gay people. I mean, this is, these are things that don't cost money, but, but are extremely harmful and painful for health. So in terms of allocating resources, let's start with what we can do with leadership that doesn't cost anything. Then look at this package of what really makes people healthy and it's not necessarily you immediately have to go even though judith you know there's so much exciting and new technologies that we need to of course access but if we can just start with people being able to have adequate sanitation and nutritious food and, and air clean air to breathe and these basic things and then of course curative health care is super important it needs to be in place but it the right to health does give that framework in terms of progressive realization. And it says that it's very important to distinguish between unwillingness and incapacity. And that's where you can also look at leadership because there are governments, of course, that don't have the resources, that are really struggling, that are paying back 
huge debt burden um, that are, are under structural adjustment that, uh, you know, or, or are, have a lot of corruption and, and are really struggling. Uh, those are governments that are really incapacitated, but they may be very willing. But then you have governments that actually would be able to, but they are diverting a lot of resources into things that are not related to human rights. Money is not going into the education sector. Money is not going into the health sector. It's going into, to, I don't know, things that are not related to building a human rights, a fostering society, um, military spending, and, 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 and uh, things that, that not necessarily jive with what human rights protections are about. So this whole issue of resources, it needs to be really unpacked and interrogated. And uh, we need to make sure that the governments that don't get off the hook because we do hear that, oh, we don't have the money. And we're sorry, you know, people can't get uh, health care because it's unaffordable. But health needs to be one of those pillars in society like a justice system. We need to have a health system. We need to have an education system. And these are basic pillars of, of, a, of a good uh, governance in society today. And I think COVID coming back to to the point that Lucy just made. It's an opportunity for us to seize now and say, let's, let's just make sure health and health systems are central to a development and economic growth and sustainable development over. I see other panelists want to join the discussion. Alicia, you raised your hand first. Actually, I think Judith raised her hand first, but I'm happy to go. Uh, so I, I, I um, of course, agree with uh, um, the thrust of what Helena just said. And in fact, the case, uh, the, the Ugandan case on maternal health care that I alluded to is something that I worked on for years and years in the constitutional court there. You know, Uganda is a very low income country, but the constitutional court explicitly said uh, we don't take the government's argument of lack of resources at face value because of all of the mineral resources that they have that could be going into life-saving maternal health care. Uganda is an extremely high uh, maternal mortality rate. But having said that, I, I don't, uh, I, I work, uh, as you said at the beginning in introducing me, I'm on the WHO's technical advisory group on health technology assessments. I also do a lot of uh, fair financing work in health systems. And I, I am uh, more critical and um, uh, and I think that, that human rights is, has not been as focused as it should be on trade-offs and priority setting. The cases are not always easy between, of course, everybody should have clean water and everybody should have vaccinations and we shouldn't have tertiary care for cancer. But really the trade-offs that are being made in health systems around the world are far more nuanced and complicated. And we've seen that in COVID, right? Uh, is COVID, which is a disease that affects a uh, huge swath of the population, more important? Should other services that are uh, affect a, a possibly marginalized or discriminated against population be preserved in the face of a larger aggregate uh, need for treating COVID. So I think the cases are quite a bit more difficult. Um, and also human rights has largely been about the relationship between people and their sovereign government. And as Helena said, uh, alluded to, we live in a world that has grown ever more increasingly unequal and global inequality, I think, is, is just absolutely starkly apparent during this pandemic. And I don't believe that human rights law has taken that as uh, seriously as it might, because we cannot have health justice without greater um, global income equality and wealth equality among nations. Um, and I have one more point, if I can just go on for one minute. I think one of the things that I have learned from COVID and, I've, and 
has reinforced some of the work in priority setting links to things that Helena, Judith, and uh, Lucy said, which is it, Helena emphasized the role of participation in the HIV AIDS community. And we've seen that has been a recommendation from the WHO throughout epidemics. It's been, we've seen where people are participating more, um, they, there is greater trust. Uh, Sheila Jasanoff did a wonderful comparative study on uh, trust in COVID responses across countries. Um, that has a lot to do with, um, you know, what Lucy was saying about messaging and not just hammering on uh, public health says this in the context of evolving information. So it's not just the government or the public health authorities telling people what they need to do and giving them accurate information that is accessible and uh, appropriate and not, you know, but it's also them feeling like they're engaged in making those decisions about the necessary trade-offs, about whether schools need to be closed, about uh, restrictions on movement, about how contact tracing is going to work. And finally, going to Judith's presentation, part of this is because health systems have become increasingly complex and focused on technology and biotechnology and divorced from democratic accountability and i think all of those things have created quite a perfect storm in covid i'll stop i'm sorry to have gone on so long Judith, your turn now please uh Yes, I think it's a very good line of argument uh, after Lucy and Alice and I at first I wanted to comment on how much I liked uh, in Lucy's presentation to emphasize that we are dealing not only with one crisis. So in addition to COVID-19 pandemics, there is enormously difficult situation in terms of uh, access to information and the relationship between politics and science. And I think COVID-19 pandemic reached uh, in a very bad shape of uh, the international uh, arena. The role of WHO has been diminished. There was a confusion and, uh, between connections of science and uh, politics. And there was also how the whole pandemic started, if we all remember the case of Li Wan Liang, who was silenced, the Chinese ophthalmologist who wanted to first time to warn the world that the, um, the virus can spread uh, from human to human. And he was silenced and we didn't get the information in time. So by the time it reached Europe, uh, then we realized that all of a sudden that what is the nature of this new pandemic. And since the beginning, there was a very strange relationship between politics and science and many countries adopted this overnight measures not explaining to people what's happening politicization of science often countries uh, people in a military dress spoke about the uh, pandemic in, in my country has also happened suddenly who can decide about which treatments the people will get they started to use military language uh, which was very unusual to people and of course no wonder that it provoked the strong reactions um, those people uh, could decide it is military leadership over the hospitals which treatment can be postponed in case of flattening the curve so that the hospitals intensive care units will not be overburdened. We all remember the Italian uh, anesthesiologist uh, ethical guidelines, which started to have going beyond the triage and started to take into consideration age and other factors in allocating healthcare services, which was very unusual in the time. It, it, this is, uh, of course, against the human rights principles. And in many countries also, they adopted that. Moreover, I think that there was another problem of not only the politicization of science, but scientification of politics, 
uh, sometimes we, we have a minister of foreign affairs who were deciding about vaccination. And there was a very similar war between East and West vaccines, like during the polio pandemics in Hungary, whether we got the Salk or Sabin help. And in, in Hungary, for instance, the government, because of political ties, they wanted to emphasize the access to Sputnik, the Russian and the Chinese vaccine uh, in contrast with the European registered vaccinations. And people were pushed even, uh, it was a kind of political choice even made uh, which vaccines you would accept. And all these things, of course, confuse people. I just wanted to add in, in addition, what happened to the media or in uh, social uh, platforms, it, uh, governments also contributed into this um, uneasiness and even of uh, difficulties to get of uh, good information. And I think that there, uh, since it has been already for two years, we should also not forget about the state of emergency provides uh, unprecedented tools for the governments to shape of the legal framework. And unfortunately, it happened in many countries that the measures which were taken were unrelated to COVID pandemic. For instance, sexual and minority rights, abortion laws have been in fact also Hungary, Poland, several other countries. I could mention the case. And, and of course, the, this kind of uh, uh, appetite for the power uh, that they can do now, because this is an extraordinary situation, they can uh, have a speedy uh, lawmaking machines and they can also attach uh, uh, um, to these uh, pandemic measures to other rights. But if you look in, in details, basically all human rights have been affected. And I for, uh, like very much Lucy's analysis uh, in the pandemic, we tend to think about of a right to health, but even right to health had many dimensions, those who were infected, those who couldn't get the vaccines, those people who didn't get the care. We will have also enormous problems in the future because preventive cares were canceled. People couldn't go for a regular checkups and I think it will come later on. Even uh, pain management was not adequately accessible in many countries, women with endometriosis and several other conditions couldn't get uh, elective surgeries were not provided in many countries. We have about in my country 50,000 surgeries uh, which are still not uh, been um, uh, given to people who were uh, needed that. So the respect for autonomy was also challenged, right to health, right to privacy, scientific freedoms. The scientists were often silenced or for instance in, in my country in, in Hungary they cannot have a, a report about what's happening in the intensive care units, which sometimes would help people to notify them uh, about the gravity of the pandemic, but actually they want to conceal, they don't want. So uh, actually the Hungarian media went to other countries to have uh, films about what's happening in these units. So I, I think uh, we have, when you mentioned the track and tracing technologies and challenges to privacy, I think that there are two uh, avenues, uh, uh, which uh, one is that to get back uh, uh, at taking a right to have seriously, many organizations, scholars argue to rebalancing of human rights and, and uh, to consider health is not just a state goal, but it is, but it's taking very seriously because we learned from this pandemic that actually without this health access to health, we cannot exercise many other uh, basic human rights as well. But, uh, there is also a fear that in many countries surveillance and that a technology substituted healthcare. And I think we should also make a distinction that they cannot uh, be trade-offs as I as it was so Alice uh, referred to that. And I think it's important that, okay, we have a very good technical means and sometimes it's better to have the quarantine rules are uh, measured by uh, a technical um, applications rather than a policeman is standing in front of your gate. Uh, but I think that in many ways, uh, it's, it's, there is a fear in the people that this kind of uh, prolonged uh, uh, and normalizing the state of emergency and extraordinary matters will be more uh, invasive to human rights. And I think that, um, so we, we should, it's very difficult to find the proper balance 
between of using these new techniques of monitoring some aspects of the uh, pandemic, but not to be too, too intrusive into the human rights. But I, I think that this kind of multiple wars or crisis, which Lucy describes, is very much um, making it more difficult how to balance between uh, these various aspects of privacy on one hand and also making sure that we tackle the pandemic and also try to uh, rebalance the role of uh, right to health, uh, uh, which I, I think it could be one of the consequences of the pandemic. But unfortunately, these extended measures on behalf of the state of emergency is also taking away every day some forms of human rights and education is also one. Uh, I think that there are children who is, is, is already the third academic year in which they uh, may not able to have a full access to education and level of digitalization in some countries are extremely low and even uh, how they the parents may assist to uh, children that could be also uh, uh, different and, and as also access to health, uh, it, it, it couldn't be fully digitalized some, some respects I tried to do, but during the pandemic, uh, I think it was the first time, not only the first time in the modern times uh, that there was a global lockdown, but the first time when people didn't go to healthcare in order to make sure that the healthcare is able to operate uh, uh, for the COVID patients. And this is very unusual way. You don't, we used to get the information whenever you have a symptoms, go to the doctor, go to the doctor in time. And now there's a different message. Don't go to the doctor uh, when it's not necessary because you have to flatten the curve. It's a very different and just, I, I don't want to defend the people who had the more and more frustrating uh, voices, but I think this confusion, it's very much related to of a, uh, suddenly uh, in a completely changing information about uh, how health should be protected. Lucy, I see you raised your hand. It's just such a fascinating conversation, and I would love to get opinions from people about some of the way things have gotten top turvy, like in the right to health care, you know, in the United States now, because of this misinformation campaign, we have patients suing doctors to get ivermectin, which has been totally discredited by scientists. And that that's a whole fluid frontier, I think. And then I think Judith's absolutely right. When I was um, researching as part of my comments, I was reading a number of studies that talk about um, how the emergency of COVID-19 has now been interpreted in Asia to suppress a number of dissidents and activists who, who are being arrested under new laws that say they're doing false information and the laws are supposedly about COVID-19, but are being used for these other purposes. So your comment is absolutely germane. Thank you. So let me start go to questions we are receiving from our audience. And one of the participants is asking, what are some significant issues that limit access to healthcare that you think are underrepresented in public discourse or scholarly publications? So what health issues are not discussed or healthcare problems are not discussed in scholarly publications? During COVID or in general, I assume in general? I, th I think it is in general. Yes, please, Alicia. Well, I, I would say not necessarily underrepresented, but there is, I think, still uh, an unfortunate separation or marginalization of um, the effects of COVID on persons living with different kinds of disabilities. I saw that in the Q&A of the scholarship that links um, right to health with disability rights, uh, some misunderstandings that the right to health means that people living with disabilities can be coercively treated. 
Um, so I would say that is probably an area that is understudied in the public health literature. And this is an issue for institutions like the WHO. There is much more evidence of interventions, for example, on HIV, right? We have a gazillion uh, studies about all kinds of different studies on HIV. But the more social determinant questions like um, uh, education for women or lack of child marriage, those kinds of issues and their health impacts. And so how countries should actually prioritize those larger social determinant questions as opposed to medical care in, in specific areas is I think under uh, reflected both in NIH research and in global health research. Another question touches on what you, Lucy, said about misinformation, fake news, uh, and uh, use of vaccines. A person is asking, how do you think public health officials can combat misinformation that has in the detrimental effect on public health? Oh, I um. I mean, I think there's some research coming out that's very interesting. Uh, there's a book that I'm reading called Stuck, and she's talking about how misinformation is stickier. So the uh, approaches we use to combat misinformation have to be different so we don't inadvertently repeat the message and 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 make it stick even more. We have to find ways that are real scientific based messaging can get in front of those that are that are false. Um, and around vaccines, I think I would also look to Judith for that answer. You know, some of the serious misinformation about the vaccines is because two of them, Pfizer and Moderna, are mRNA vaccines. So they're new, they've not been used before. It doesn't matter that you tell people it's been 15 years of research. This is just the fruition of what had been very scientifically plausible and researched, but that's a source of misinformation. Um, you know, I don't think the social media giants, I, I quoted that they took off 20 million pieces, that's Facebook alone. Lots of other platforms are the sharing. I, I think there needs to be a more rigorous, but then you worry because is that leading to too much examination and, and, and limiting then the freedom of speech? Um, it's difficult. That would be my first take. If I may say something that because of the, the emergency situation, measures and about vaccines and also what to do were announced day by uh, overnight, basically for next day that would be lockdown. So actually it was uh, very similar than some other legal measures are, are taken very serious one. And there was no place for interaction consultations and people got used to that actually in Oviedo convention there is a rule that if there is a new technology they should have a public consultation and and because in the lack of time they could have public consultation so especially when changing messages but bombarded people and and actually in a very imperative uh, terms because they have to comply with these measures then uh, there is the reaction is also of something of, of, of try to deny this or for a while they comply and then don't comply or they don't understand. Uh, and I think that um, using the digital technologies for some kind of forum that people could ask questions directly from uh, scientists that would be very helpful. Katalin Koriko, who is a Hungarian uh, scientist who was behind the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines RNR techniques uh, she was she tried to uh, solve this issue and answered on the Facebook 
very diligently for Hungarians who didn't trust their governments, but they wanted to have uh, questions and answers from her. And, and she tried, sometimes she collected all the questions and it turned that there was enormous need for people uh, that they can directly ask questions about the age or about their certain conditions, if they had, could I get the vaccines, if I have an auto, autoimmune disease, et cetera. And she tried to respond in Hungarian uh, to these questions. And I, I, I think that maybe some other scientists uh, uh, try to do something, but it means that the people had a need had a need to uh, be consulted rather than uh, to face with imperatives and uh, and uh, but especially when the politicians try to uh, send a message for people what should you do next morning thank you i think we had a very interesting discussion and we have even more questions than answers and probably more questions than we had at the beginning of this panel and because we are the library and uh, most of our audience is coming to the library for in search of research resources, I want to ask probably the last question during this discussion. What our panelists would recommend as uh, research resources for health and human rights? How to do research in this field? What will you suggest? Maybe professors? Uh, well, I can take a stab and let other people uh, fill in. So what I tried to outline in my initial remarks is that it's just way too simplistic to look at international treaties and the soft law general comments that come out of, of those treaty monitoring bodies, because that's not what the right to health means in domestic contexts. Um, so, I, 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 and I, I find this when I'm uh, overseeing students, you know, when I'm teaching or overseeing student research, it's, it's really very important to have a sense of how these different levels of law intersect. And then, of course, also look at what are the social norms and institutional practices that present barriers to effective enjoyment in in practice, in reality. But it's it's very important doing research to have a sense of how the international norms, but also institutional mechanisms and procedures intersect with constitutional and national, it's even more complicated in federalist systems, you know, like the United States or Argentina or Mexico or you know, many other countries. So um, with, with that level of law um, and, and then look at um, judicial construction. Um, so it is not a simple, straightforward undertaking to say how many countries have the right to health and what it means, because different countries will recognize pieces and courts will have interpreted it in different ways and things change over time. As I said at the beginning, it's a very unstable norm. So I would recommend in doing research that um, you know people gather information from various sources and patiently work with their wonderful and beloved law librarians. Thank you. And I would like to thank once again all our speakers for your wonderful presentations and invite the law librarian of Congress, Aslihan Bulut for closing remarks. Thank you to our panelists and our moderator for, for such a thought provoking discussion. And thank you all for joining us to commemorate the Human Rights Day. Before we end our program, I'd like to invite you to visit the Law Library's Legal Research Institute site at law.gov, where you can learn about our upcoming foreign and domestic law webinars and events. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, thanks again and happy Human Rights Day.